Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to North Point Plus. This is episode 82. <laughs> well, hello, <laughs> everyone. I don't know. I gotta. I think that was the nicest way. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'll work on some voices. Uh, Do the whole thing in like a British accent or something. Oh, that would be very fun. Hey, I don't know. I, you know, I uh, used to read to my kids when they were little, and I would read in accents. And oh. um, when our oldest was about nine, um, I'm reading, and she said, Dad, could you quit reading with accidents? <laughs> oh, oh, that's cute. Said, he said, uh, yeah, I, I can. Saying, when I answer <laughs> the phone, that's what I say. Always, with you, I'm like, hello. Hello. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's a good way to say it. But welcome, everybody. Episode 82 of North Point Plus. This is the podcast where we go um, over the message on Sunday. Um, some people submitted questions, so we just get to dive a little bit deeper. Rick was our speaker on Sunday. Um, yes, I was. Uh, do you want to give a little... First of all, first First off, this week's Easter, so I want to oh, know, yeah. are you a jelly bean person? Uh, Starburst jelly beans. S only Starburst, not Brock's? No. My whole family loves the Starburst jelly beans. We've already gotten bags of them. The bags oh, are already no gone. Kidding. Yeah, They're, like, uh, You're already through them. Oh, yeah, like multiple bags. And I come over, and it's a little jar right when you walk in on our kitchen in my parents' house. You don't have any in your office. No, I don't. <laughs> well, that's on purpose. I can't, I'll be sitting there all day eating Snurping. jelly beans. Um, yeah. Are you a peeps person? No, but was it two years ago, our life group went to the park, and Andy Acker, our student uh, minister guy, he had a drone, and we took him to the park, and we were dropping peeps from the drone. No kidding. Yeah, yep. That was like, oh gosh, I think two years ago, maybe. That's fun. Did yeah. people try and catch him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was competitive. Like, I was boxing out my husband. I was like, we're <laughs> looking at the sky, Did trying you, to... With your hands or with your mouth? Oh, we tried both, but to keep the peep on the drone at one point, we had to like pin it up there. Oh. And so once we started sticking stuff in it, we were like, okay, we shouldn't do this with our mouths anymore. So it was mostly hands. You but could have sanitized the pins. But yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. You could have, but <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, well, so what do you like? I'm a peeps like? guy. Really? Oh, yeah. You ever put one in the microwave? Um, I have not done that. Okay. Maybe but I have been known to eat an entire package um, hey, before church that, you know, on Easter morning. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, if they don't make the packaging resealable, I think you have to eat it all. That's true. Day. Although, if they stay in the package and then they get crusty on the outside, that's not bad either. Ooh, all right, a little that's, stale. Yeah. Stale peeps. I, uh, you heard yeah. it here. If your kids <laughs> don't right. finish it, bring them to Rick. Bring them to Rick. <laughs> yeah, I, and I'm a jelly bean guy, and Brock's are okay. But Starburst are very good. Oh, yeah. So good. And you can yeah. get the bags that are just the red ones. And we do oh, all, no kidding. all that. Oh, yeah. Connoisseurs, huh. our family. <laughs> Easter Starburst egg jelly bean. Connoisseurs. <laughs> yeah. So, well, did you want to run through um, the message a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. So, um, Sunday's message was uh, Palm Sunday about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. That was really kind of the passage where I that I took off from, but the whole concept of the Easter egg, the the um, the something that's hidden there in plain sight, was that they rec that the Jews recognized that when Jesus came into Jerusalem, that he was the king, and um, and that was a big deal. They they went crazy. I I thought about trying to talk about. Um, the coronation in England oh. uh, rel relative to this particular passage. Um, but the it would have worked better in a month because I th I read that that I, I still can't say Charles the mm third -hmm. Prince Charles uh, coronation is I think May the sixth so it's only a month away and that's when they'll have the big celebration and the party and and the the coronation the the procession all of that stuff that really I think kind of reminds us of what happened when Jesus came into Jerusalem um, but it just made me think of. Uh, Prince Charles and Princess Di's wedding, which you probably don't remember. No, I know it off the crown, though. You mentioned that on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. it's like I've seen those. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so it was a big deal as Jesus came in. But the, really, the heart of the message was that Jesus is King, that that He's the King of Kings, and that He wants to be our King, and that um, that means that He has complete control. So that's that really was the synopsis of the whole deal. Okay. Well, you said synopsis. And oh. so I, it's funny, you kind of segue into one of my questions. What are the synoptic gospels? So, um, so you said, just so you know how this works behind the scenes, sometimes 
I write questions. Um, <laughs> Cause Sylvia just asked that, but she said, yeah. I don't remember you saying that. So, yeah. um, so I, I just mentioned it in passing um, both services. And this is just kind of a background thing that's good to know. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar mm -hmm. in terms of what they describe, the events that they describe in the Gospels, um, all three different perspectives. Mark would have got his perspective primarily from Peter. Um, Matthew and Luke, Matthew would have had a, f a front row seat as one of the disciples. Luke um, would have, uh, as a, not one of the 12, but as a disciple, would have probably seen most of everything firsthand or had firsthand accounts. Those three views are very similar. And so if you go back to your Greek Latin roots, sin optic, same view, same, same eye. Um, so they're very similar in terms of, of how they describe Jesus' ministry. John is not one of the synoptic Gospels. He has a completely different perspective, and he obviously was one of the 12 and, and uh, front row seat to everything, but he much of John's Gospel um, really focuses on who Jesus is, not as much what he did. And so, like John has three chapters on on Jesus' last, the last things that he said to the disciples in those last few days before he was crucified. So um, John 14, 15, 16, 17, all, all of that is, um, is really kind of a challenge. So John's not a synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptics. They all three give almost word-for-word -word, um, descriptions of what happens with the triumphal entry. When, um, when I was in college, um, I, I'm smiling because if Deb listens to this, she, um, she will have something to say, I'll tell you in a second. Um, we took a class called the Gospels, and um, there were four Gospels classes that, that um, covered the four uh, sections of Jesus' ministry, the early Galilee and late Galilee and Jerusalem and the final week. And, um, and part of the, one of the projects that we had to do in that class was to take passages of scripture that were similar and then harmonize them. So we had to, you had to lay it out. So word for word, how it made sense. We'll, and we'll actually talk about that a little bit more um, relative to the, the, to the donkey question. Um, but we had to lay that out and, and say, okay, this is the, if you take these two views and bring them together, what did it really look like? And, and solve any apparent um, inconsistencies, that kind of thing. It was a really cool thing. Um, so, so we did that, um, it, harmonizing things, and um, Deb got a higher grade than I did. Yeah. On <laughs> oh, nice, so, Deb. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I'm sure she, yep. I wouldn't let that so, go. Yeah, she reminds me occasionally. <laughs> Yeah. Funny. Well, you, so you mentioned the donkey question. So yeah, um, it's just like about Jesus rode a donkey when he entered Jerusalem, but it always sounded like there was a donkey in a colt. Um, and in pictures, there's just the one animal. So <laughs> kind of just um, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So so it's it's funny because as you read, uh, particularly in Matthew in the in the Matthew account. It's um, there is a phrase, I think, in 21 seven that it says they brought the donkey and the colt to Jesus. Um, but uh, so, and everybody else just mentions either a donkey or a colt. John mentions a donkey and a colt, but he uses colt to describe donkey. So how does that make sense? Is that a contradiction in Scripture? That's really the, the heart of that question. Mm -hmm. And so in that um, in the harmony uh, harmonizing those four passages and, and laying them out and saying, okay, um, how do you make sense of this? So if you were to do a harmony of the, of the triumphal entry, you would take each passage, you would lay out word for word how it, how it matches up, and then you'd try and figure out if there was any inconsistencies or things that didn't make sense, how that would make sense from the four different views. Um, so there are two words that are used in the original language in Greek that describe colt and donkey. The word for colt, which is kind of interesting, is polos, which sounds like polo. Mm -hmm. um, not like Marco Polo, but um, <laughs> po polo, the game that they mm -hmm. play on horses. So that's the word for colt, polo. And, and what it really means, uh, it means colt or a young, uh, a young horse, a young animal. Uh, the word for donkey is anas, and, um, and it's the word that's translated as. Oh. Um, also, it's, it's the donkey word. Mm. Um, 
And so it describes when, when Jesus tells his, um, his disciples, hey, go, and there's going to be this donkey that's never been written, and then they bring a colt to him. How's that make sense? Well, the word f- that's there for colt, the, the Greek word that's there for colt means young animal. And, and 21, Matthew 21.7 is the place that's really kind of problematic because it says colt and donkey. Um, the word and is in Greek. Boy, I'm... This is like this is like graduate level stuff. The word Greek is the word chi, and it means and. But um, as you look at it and the way that it's laid out, um, it really makes sense that it's describing one animal, not two animals, and that colt would be the word that they would use to describe a young donkey as well. Right. So they're really just using the the colt as like the young animal, like you were saying. So it, that's why they go hand in yeah, hand. Yeah. Okay. It, so so it does make sense. And it's like it's like if we were to talk about a horse and a colt mm-hmm. and somebody would say, wait a second, you said a horse. Well, a colt's a young horse. And yeah. that word for colt would be used to describe a young donkey as well. Gotcha. Okay. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, And so our next kind of question here to talk about is the first Samuel 8. A king would make significant demands, but they still wanted a king. Yeah. So. Yeah. um, To to me, in in terms of um, kind of setting the stage for the for the whole um, Easter egg, that that whole concept of the significance of the king coming, um, I I just really loved diving into first Samuel 8 where uh, it had been a long time since I had studied it, that they, um, that the Israelites said, we want a king. And, um, and they, they, they did because Samuel, who was the last in the line of judges, his sons were corrupt. They, they're taking bribes, they're doing stuff. And, and so the Jewish leaders come and rightly say, this isn't right. So it, what they said wrong was, give us a king. And, um, and God said, uh, Samuel said, you don't really want a king. And they said, no, we really want a king. Mm-hmm. And, um, and God said, okay, tell them what that is going to look like. And in that passage that I read from 1 Samuel 8 that I didn't have on screen, because um, I just wanted people to listen to it, but I would say, man, it, if you just take a second and go back and look that up over and over again, um, Samuel says, okay, this is what's going to happen with the king. He's going to take your sons, and he's going he's to make warriors out of them. He, they're going to lead. They're not going to be around. You know, your grandkids are not going to be around playing because your because your mm-hmm. sons are serving the king. And he's going to take your daughters and you're you know, you're not going to see your grandkids because your daughter, the daughters are cooking and doing all kinds of stuff for the king. Um, they're they're going to be sent out. He's going to take your servants. He's going to take your land. He's going to take your um, uh, your crops, you know, the harvest. He's going to he's going to take everything. And it was really interesting to me that in that passage, he says the king is going to take a tenth of everything. Um, everything that you have, a, 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 a tenth of your crops, a tenth of your harvest, a tenth of your livestock. Um, and to think about, you know, for most of us, we think, oh, goodness, if the government only took 10 percent, <laughs> that would be so much better. Um, but it's interesting to me also that we often um, balk at the concept of a tithe, uh, you know, uh, of giving God back a tenth mm-hmm. and that... Um, that, that Samuel says to the Israelites, the king is going to take a tenth. He's just going to take it right off the top. Um, and, and ultimately, they still say, yeah, we know that. We want a king. Um, because everybody else has a king, we want to be like everybody else. And, um, and so the, the, uh, the, to me, it's, I think that it helps when we think about our relationship with Jesus to realize that the king made demands and the people didn't have any choice in it. We tend to think, yeah, God makes demands on my life, but I have a choice of which one mm-hmm. I choose or not. And we don't really. If Jesus is king, he speaks into every aspect of our life, and we choose, we either choose to obey or not. But if we choose not to obey, he's not really king. He's not really Lord. Yeah, and I think we all know somebody like that, and or even like ourselves sometimes. It's like the picking and choosing or like all that, where it's yeah. like it gets kind of... I think we all do that. Yeah. Which which is why I th- wanted to talk about it, because that ought not be. Well, and I like how you also on Sunday brought up like... Um, 
like election stuff where everybody thinks, oh, but if this person was in charge, it would be so much better. And I really appreciated um, you saying that, and you've said that before, but just because I see a lot on social media and, you know, just where people say like, oh, well, if this person was in, instead of this, and it was just kind of like, I, I God is going to make his way happen no matter what. And right. I think we still see that when the Israelites made a decision and, and or, you know, and had yeah. it kind of like, no, we still want this person as a, or, you know, we still want a king. Um, but like God still made his way and like he still yeah. had his plan all laid out and everything. So I think that that's just, I don't know why we forget about that sometimes. Yeah. I, I think that we tend to think um, the right leader will solve our problems. Yeah. And, um, and that's just not the case because our problems are our problems. Mm -hmm. They're problems with the human heart not problems from a geopolitical kind of standpoint. Yeah, there are political problems, right. obviously. Yeah. And, um, and I'm grateful for Christians who serve in that world, but they will never change people's hearts. Um, and so um, I think when they serve, their, their role is really to say, how do, how do I serve God in this geopolitical kind of role in a way that honors him? Mm -hmm. um, and, and um, you know, people say you can't legislate morality. Yeah, you can, because we do. We, yeah, when we legislate, we say this is right or wrong. But, um, again, that's from a, that's from a um, political uh, standpoint. And what really matters is what's going on inside us. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was fun to just even um, in the midst of that part of the message, to know that we have people who serve in those kind of roles oh. at North Point, which is which is a really really cool thing and really important, but they can't change people's hearts. Right, only God can. Um, so this next question is uh, from somebody that they sent it in. Um, if Jesus is King now, why do we have to wait for the end? What's described in Revelation? Um, that that's a great question because I I intentionally wanted to go to Revelation because Revelation is so absolutely clear about um, Jesus being King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We talked about capital K yeah. and capital L um, of the lowercase K. Yeah, that was cool. I, love, I wrote that down. That was a note oh, of mine because I thought Had, that had was you not cool. thought about that before? Well, it's kind of one of those things you always see and like you know that it's capitalized, but yeah, in that context, I'm like, I don't know if I've ever or like realized what it yeah. meant, but um, y y the first time I realized it, like I said, I'd been I'd been a Christian for probably 20 years, but I was writing something that had to be edited. Oh, yeah. And and I wrote it. I actually wrote King lowercase of King's uppercase mm. or maybe I wrote lowercase K and lowercase K. Right. And and just I remember thinking that seems weird. How's that supposed to be? And sent it through and it, then it got edited mm. and it, and it was uppercase uh, capital and then lowercase. And it was like, Oh, that's, there's something really significant. It in, yeah, yeah. In that, um, just for perspective that we just don't think about very much. Mm. So, yeah. Um, so, the, so the thing with, with Jesus, he, he is King. He's King. Now he, he, he was King um, when he lived on earth, um, he's uh, king of the universe. But even as king, he doesn't necessarily, uh, he allows, he permits stuff to happen on earth that's not necessarily his will because he's not, um, uh, the world that we live in is not what it will be when Jesus returns. When Once sin's gone, once all of the brokenness is gone, then there's lots of stuff that we won't have to worry about. But Jesus is still king, even though he allows stuff to occur that's not a part of his heart or character or what he desires, um, which is the same thing um, right now. President Biden is the chief executive. He's the commander in chief of the armies. He's the chief executive of the United States. Lots of stuff happens in the U.S. that he he wishes wouldn't happen, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, and you can scale that down to whatever, the mayor of DeWitt or St. John's or whatever, mm -hmm. stuff happens that they don't want to ha have happen. That doesn't change their power. It doesn't change their position. And so Jesus' position as king isn't jeopardized by the sin, his 
position and power is still the same. It's just that he withholds his absolute power that he will that he will display um, when he returns. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe I've just always um, thought of it kind of kind of like what you said, like different things, like completely like, yeah, he's king now and it is that. But it's like once all the revelation stuff happens, it's going to be completely different. Yeah. Like, like I it'll be a different world. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, the new heaven and a new earth. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, you read from Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Um, in those verses, it talks about his name four times, faithful, true, word of God, king of kings and lord of lords. Is that significant in some way? And then they also said, great message, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's nice when you say nice things. I yeah. appreciate the encouragement. <laughs> the, um, I, I think when you read through the book of Revelation, I, it's funny, I was having a conversation with Larry Carter uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Revelation, and um, and he said that he had a conversation with somebody who had their doctorate, and their doctoral thesis was on the book of Revelation, and and Larry said that he had talked to the guy and the the uh, and said, okay, explain it to me. You've got a doctorate in this, and the guy said, we don't know, no. we don't know. Yeah. You know, he said, I can tell you lots of stuff that people think. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the but one of the cool things uh, I, what I shared with him was another uh, another guy who's been kind of a mentor and friend influence on me that I heard speak one time that um, said he was he was the lead pastor at a church and he said I've got to figure out people want to do they want me to preach through Revelation I've got to figure out how to do that do it effectively do it in a way that honors God that's consistent with the text mm -hmm. all of those things. Um, he said, the only way I can figure out how to do that is to just read through Revelation over and over and over again. And I think that he said for six weeks, every day he read the entire book of Revelation oh, wow. to just try and understand it better. And he said at the end of that time, the, the big thing that he walked away with that was like, oh, this makes sense. It's not about the specifics. It's about the theme. It's, it's about the big picture of what Revelation describes. Um, and we get caught up in, okay, what are the lampstands? What are the bulls? What's the time frame? All of those things that, that are listed, you know, who's uh, w w w the great, w you know, the judgment, all of those things. How's that all that fit mm -hmm. together? Um, and he said, it really is just big picture themes. The, the Jesus is coming back. He, he has won, there's going to be justice, all those kinds of things. That's really the heart of Revelation. If you read through Revelation, though, I think one of the cool things, if you just read through it, is to note all the different names that there are for Jesus. Mm. So he's described faithful, true, uh, the Lamb of God. Um, he's the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, um, the Word of God that, that's mentioned there. I think all of those names are really significant because they describe either the character or the position of Jesus. Mm. Um, it, it really is who he is, not like a name like, you know, saying, Sylvia, Sylvia's your name. That's what we call you. But that's not, that is who you are, but that's not who you are. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, it's, and, and in Revelation. So you should call me cool, smart, funny. And then those are things that Absolutely. <laughs> Farm girl. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, that too. <laughs> um, uh, all those things. That I, I think when you read through Revelation, I'm sorry about that. That was, that was not very kind. Um, yes. I I'll add humble to that. Hum humble's good. <laughs> um, just kidding. Caring, compassionate. There, that's what I meant um, to say. Joyful, <laughs> all those things. Um I think that that uh, when you read the book of Revelation and focus on the names of Jesus, that brings Revelation in a completely different kind of context, too, because you start to see not so much the details of the events, but who he is and who God is, and that's cool. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's really interesting, just all the different names, because um, I feel like it would be confusing for somebody who is just starting out because uh -huh. it's kind of like what the heck like word of god like what that's a yeah. name you know like that's a yeah. name but um as you were talking i was just kind of thinking too like people tend to try to you know figure things out how we were talking about like the colt and the donkey like the differences yeah um 
when it, that's not the big picture, you know? Right. And so, like, why do you think that we do that? Like, Revelation, I feel like people are trying to figure out when end times is like right. going to be and when is it going to happen? Yeah. Even though it says y- you won't, you're not going to You're never figured yeah. out. But why do you think that, you know, we look at those things and try to pick out? Uh, I think, I think that um, the way that God made us or the way that Satan corrupted us, one mm-hmm. of the two, is that we want to try and figure things out so we'll be as smart as God. Mm-hmm. You know, that Satan said to Eve, God knows if you eat this fruit, you'll know everything the same way he does. And that was a lie. But I think that in, in us, um, from that point in time, there is this kind of thing, oh, we, we want to be smarter than X, Y, Z. We want to we figure all that stuff out. And it's really easy for Satan to distract us um, on all the little stuff, on the minutia, and to miss the big picture. Right, so it's that like inner like draw to want to learn more, but then yeah. to be caught up on those little things yeah. where it's like, this doesn't matter, though. Like, you're missing yeah. the big picture. Okay, that makes sense, because that's kind of, maybe I just had to talk it out. But that's like, because people do get hung, like, we do get hung up on that. Like, you know, we get questions like that. And, um, like, I even, you know, sometimes you think it's, if people are trying to pick it apart, yeah, you know, like oh, try to try to purposely find those things. Well, oh, it's not true because these things are different. Yeah, but um, I think it's interesting to think of it more of the fact of like, no, I have this like, I want to learn more. I want to be closer to God. But, and then when you start, you get like these little stones like kind of thrown yeah. in your way where you're like, oh, but what's this? It's like doesn't matter. Keep moving on. <laughs> like, well, and and I think there that there is a healthy perspective to be able to say. My starting point always is that God's word is true, mm-hmm. and it's not going to be inconsistent. So there's a way to figure it out. I I I just need to to really search and study and right. know that it's not going to be inconsistent. Well, and that's why we ask people like you because <laughs> then you know well, all this stuff and I, give us the master class, the mini master class of. Uh, well, I I do think though um, one of the things that I've been thinking about about the podcast and and some of the stuff, some of the questions today, just talking about harmonizing the gospel, bringing harmony to different passages and figuring that out is if we can talk about it here, it's not so that you, the listener, have answers. It's so that you, the listener, have the tools to be able to, Mm -hmm. on your own study, figure that out and to be able to say, okay, how do I make sense of this in that way? Um, Oh, goodness, there was something that we were just talking about that I I wanted to talk about. when I have people say to me, like when I get in a discussion and, and somebody will say, oh, Scripture's not, not consistent, it's inconsistent, there's, you know, there's contradictions, whatever, um, and we talk about those things, usually at some point I'll, I'll say, Let me just, let's just stop for a second. Why are you asking that question? Mm. Because fundamentally I think sometimes... Sometimes people ask because they're inquisitive and they're just trying to make sense of it. But sometimes they're asking because they think if I can prove that Scripture is uh, is it contradicts itself, then I don't have to listen to it. Mm-hmm. Then I don't have to yield to Jesus. Then I don't right. have to make Jesus king. If it is consistent, then that changes everything because it's no longer me in charge. Right. It's he who is in charge mm-hmm. and that changed um jesus was a master at when he was asked questions asking a question back and sometimes i i would just say you know when you're uh, when you're talking with people and and they say oh the bible's full of contradictions to just be able to say hmm, why do you say that and why does that why does that matter to you mm-hmm. because that opens up a completely different kind of conversation than than just feeling like you have to try and defend um yeah. yeah, and that's hard for people too because when you um, sometimes do that, the other person doesn't love like, oh, you're answer, you know, answering yeah. with a question because you don't want to, whatever. And so I think that that's hard because sometimes you know, um, the people that are saying, you know, coming at you yeah. with the there's discrepancies, almost don't even want to talk about it. So it's always worth to try to open up that yeah. avenue of um, like discussion and everything. But sometimes it's like. You know. Yeah. I, well, I think I think a, um, relationship drives everything. So if you've got the right kind of relationship yep, with someone, true. you c- you have a door to be able to have that that level of conversation. Mm-hmm. If your relationship is not real deep, 
um, they may walk away, which is really interesting because Jesus, um, several times, you know, I, uh, um, you know, the Pharisees would come to him and say, uh, what about this? What about that? What about this? And Jesus would say, uh, you know what? I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. And, and at one point, um, the Pharisees, uh, J- Jesus asked, um, here's my question for you. John the Baptist, is he from God or not? And the Pharisees um, said, well, if we say he's from God, then he's going to say, well, why didn't you listen to him then? Mm-hmm. And if we say he's not from God, the people are going to go crazy because the people think he's from God. So they didn't answer. And Jesus said, you know what? There's your answer. <laughs> well, no, actually what he said was, you don't answer, I'm not answering your question. Mm. Um, and so he just let it sit there. Right. And that's an okay thing. We, we don't need to feel like it's a defeat if somebody says, don't ask me that. And walks away. Yeah, that's not a. Yeah, that because it's still out there. Right. I, yeah. yeah. Um. And so this is the last question, mm-hmm. and it's how do I give Jesus complete control of my life, and do you have any practical advice on how to do this? That um, that's the greatest question. Mm-hmm. Whoever sent it in, that's the greatest question. How do how do we live that out? And like, what does it look like? And what does it look like? I I think there's lots of pieces to that. I think it is. Um, it involves um, ha- having a repentant heart and that recognizing that repentance is not just a one-time event. It is a one-time event, but it's also a daily event. It's uh, um, dying to yourself daily, Jesus talked about. Um, that, that there is, uh, I think, giving him complete control means that we're always thinking from the perspective of Jesus or the perspective of God. I think practically, it, it that involves when you wake up early in the morning, that one of the first things that you do is that you're thinking, God, what do you have for me today? What, help me. Um, my, my prayer um, at different times in my life, it's funny because I haven't prayed this for a while and I probably should, is God, help me to see with your eyes. Help me to, mm-hmm. s- help me to see the things, uh, help me to see with joy the things that bring you joy. Help me to see with a broken heart the things that break your heart. Um, help me to be able to respond. Um, making Jesus Lord means that we check our ambitions, our desires, our goals, and um, and let God establish those. So, so it means that you know my to do list is not nearly as important as God's to do list for me. And so, if somebody comes in the office and they've got and they want to talk. God's brought them in, and um, and that then uh, that takes precedent. You know that God, God's working in that. Or if uh, experiencing God language, if we see God working someplace, that we join Him there. That may mean that some of the things that I had planned to do, I'm not doing because I'm I'm I see what God has in store, and I and I'm going to go jump on there. So I I think you know when Paul talks about pray without ceasing, um, th- it is this this free flow spirit of prayer that happens where all the time you're just kind of talking to God and recognizing that he's with you all the time. It's so easy for us to compartmentalize and to think, okay, I'm going to church on Sunday, Mm -hmm. doing my God thing, um, and then I'm going back to the rest of life, um, as opposed to really recognizing that Jesus is in the details of everything. Yeah, I... um, yeah, what I've heard too is that like some people say like um, it's a lot like when they talk about like anxiety or depression. It's like oh, but people have it worse than me, and it's like yeah, but like God wants to hear about it. Like yeah. I, it's kind of funny because sometimes like I'll even think like oh that's so dumb. I'm like well here he already knows I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Might as well talk to him about it. I yeah, mean, <laughs> yeah, he knows what's going on in a, inside and, us. And sometimes yeah. it's hard for me to get in the prayer like mindset. I guess, um, and like I saw this one person on social media say something about like a like a like a special prayer place, but like in your imagination. So if you don't, yeah. like, and I thought that was really cool, and I've tried that, and I think it helps a lot. Like to prayer picture closet in the kind <laughs> corner of, of yeah, your mind, and yeah. I mean, hey, I just have to trick my brain like that yeah. for it to work. Um, especially you know, it's like the typical f- you fall back asleep while you're praying because yeah. you just think, but like this, you're active, and like I am like thinking of a place in my head like usually for mine like it's either out in the woods or something or if it's in like you know and I'm just like oh no like God is with me like I am here right now and it's all in my imagination but like it helps me focus and kind of 
bring everything to him. And then it's almost fun to pray because I'm like, oh, I'm just going to take a second and I'm going to picture my happy place. Yeah. Wherever that is, like if it's at a cottage or a beach or mountains, woods, whatever. And you're just sitting there and you're like, okay, like now I'm going to talk to God. So then it's, I don't know, it's kind of fun to do it that way. Um, but yeah, so, um, just to like wrap up everything that you said about the question. So if somebody wants to give Jesus complete control of their life, you said the biggest thing too, is like having a repentance heart. Yeah. Um, praying consistently yeah. and all the time, kind of a deal. Yep. And then you said one more thing. Um, I don't know that I said it, but okay. uh, but but I would I would say along with the along with the um, uh, d- just breathing, you know, kind yeah. of the breathing prayer uh, kind of thing. I think that that we live in a time where there can be incredible tools, and so. Um, I, I used this, I think, last fall in one of the message, messages in, in, in challenging people to think about who they wanted to pray for, mm. um, setting, a, setting an alarm on your, oh. on, your, on your phone to just be the reminder um, to, to pray. Um, and so I think that there's a, uh, can be a really, really good tool to, you know, whether it's every 30 minutes or every hour or whatever it is, to just just have there be a little sound that it's like, oh, yeah, I'm walking with God. Um, and it's it's not um, a burden. It's not mm-hmm. um, it's not a legalistic have-to kind of thing, but it's, oh, that's the reminder that God is here with me, mm-hmm. that I'm seeing stuff. I think another part um, is, uh, I think when we pray and ask God to help us see through His eyes, it changes the way that we do relationships because when I'm very conscious of of Jesus walking with me and who he has called me to be, it changes the way that I interact with Deb or the staff or the mailman or the guys I play racquetball with. Um, if, if, that, if I lose sight of Jesus' being with me and being a part of things, it's really easy to live in my own oh, yeah. human nature and say, that's not fair. You're not doing that to me, mm-hmm. or I'm not going to let you do that uh, uh, to, to, to take control at a completely different level. And you are really good at this. Like you, I feel like it's funny because um, we were all just talking about it, how... Um, you know, we used to pray for like, oh, let the interruptions happen because it yeah. means, you know, and um, but like you're really good at that because like you'll have a really busy day and I'm like, oh, somebody's here and wants to talk to you. And you're like, let them in. I'm like, OK, whatever you say. Like and I think that that is something that every like, oh, definitely me. Like I could definitely do better at that because sometimes yeah. I get so busy and wrapped up in my yeah. own. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I have so much to do, though, where it's like it'll get done. And like yeah. some of the things really like should not stress me out this much, like spend time with people like people are important. Like yeah. not just these little tasks, you know. I I, I do think um, to get to the heart of the question, it really is about where our mind goes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, where is it? Second Corinthians when it talks about um, taking captive every thought. Um, uh, Romans twelve when it talks about don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think that there really is this challenge that we have to think biblically, but also to think as a child of God, recognizing that the only thing that matters is God. Mm -hmm. Um, When we don't think that way, it gets gets really easy to get really um, angry when we have a flat tire. it gets really easy when our stuff gets disturbed. Um, but when we do think that way, it's it's just much easier to see with a godly perspective. And it gets into like what we always say, like if you see God working in your life, share Join it. Join him there. Like oh, in, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and like also like, you know, just be thankful for those little things. Like I said it once for like... Um, I was doing mid-service once, and I said something like... What were you doing? I was doing mid-service. It's not my favorite thing to do because I get kind of nervous getting hey, up on stage. Let, let me... Where are you? Uh, oh, uh, there. here we go. I 
just need to tell you right now in the comment section, if you like Sylvia doing mid-service, just say, Sylvia, you're great. Do mid-service more. There's going to be like four people because I've only done there, it a couple times. Everyone, but I don't everyone know write it down. <laughs> Encourage her. Yes, but it just makes me nervous sometimes getting up there. But I did say once, you know, like just being thankful for those little things when it comes like sunrises or sunsets yeah. or the snow, even though it's kind of. Ugh, it's cold out and yeah. it's snowing but like it's it's beautiful and like you know when it rains like the earth must have needed it yep. like god you know so it's R it's fun to live yeah. like that though like you it brings you these little joys where it used to be annoyances so it's just changing your thought process and everything yeah one 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 last real life mm -hmm. living this out kind of thing so um so our daughter who lives in Massachusetts four kids they are now getting close to 13, 11, 9, and 7. Um, the 13 and 11-year-old have had messenger for kids oh, mm -hmm. that their mom allows them to have, and so they'll send us messages periodically. Neither one of them do it regularly or consistently. This weekend, um, she set it up so the 7-year-old and the 9-year-old also have, <laughs> have um, messenger, and there's a limited number of people that they can contact. So Sunday afternoon, um, or it's Saturday, Sunday, somewhere in there, they got hooked up. So the nine-year-old sends me a message, and he's a typical nine-year-old boy, so it's kind of like, you know, he does a drawing and says, what's this? Or, um, you know, I'll say something back, and then he'll write three lines of ha, 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 ha. <laughs> um, the seven-year-old, though, discovered, um, the seven-year-old girl, she discovered that with Messenger, we can do... Um, we can do uh, phone calls where we can see each oh, other. Mm -hmm. So she'd call and talk to me and then leave the phone run, uh, leave the thing on yeah. and start talking to her brothers, doing all kinds of stuff. And then she'd say, oh, grandpa, and turn me off. You know? <laughs> and then like 15 seconds later, she'd call back again. So I think in one 15-minute period, I think I had six calls from her <laughs> on um, either Saturday or Sunday. And I thought, I'm, you know, I'm sitting there thinking – do I just stop this or not? And thought, no, I'm not stopping it. Because yeah. if she feels like she can talk to me anytime, that's the best thing in the world. And when yeah. we go out and visit them, it will make our time together even more rich. And, um, and if she knows that she's loved because of my accessibility, mm -hmm. that's just all the better. And that really is a picture of our relationship with God, mm -hmm. you know, because there there are times that like things are crazy and we're saying, ah, help. Mm -hmm. And and then God intervenes, fixes stuff, and then we kind of go flitter off and do our own thing. Um, but he's always there ready as soon as we uh, as soon as we call. As yeah. soon, you know, as soon as soon as we turn to him. So yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Rick, for answering all those questions. <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia. Yeah. Don't forget in the comments, Sylvia for mid service spokes we'll button. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> um, well, thanks everybody Don't you for. Think should be good. Hey, hey! <laughs> thank you everybody for watching. <laughs> this, this is like um, uh, podcast arm twisting. A little bit, yeah, uh, like peer pressure. Yeah, but absolutely. Like with the whole church. congregation pressure. The whole the whole church peer pressure for Sylvia. <laughs> oh goodness! Well, this has been great. Thanks for hosting. <laughs> yes, no problem. Uh, thank you everybody for watching. Please like, subscribe, share, um, just to get this out there and have a good week. We uh, want to remind you, we do. have have a good friday service at 7 p.m and yeah. then our easter services are our regular times 9 30 and 11 and the the uh the prayer walk opportunity is uh, it's actually it's out today uh well uh, it uh, got put out and so you can drive through the circular driveway or if you're out walking into it and or you just want to park and walk that area yep, on the web road side on the web road side you can do that circular driveway and and just spend some time um, thinking about how much god loves you and the price that jesus paid yeah hope to see you friday for good friday service mm -hmm.